If you're brand new to Hope City, I'd love to have an anchor verse for the weekend. Our anchor verse for this weekend is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7 on the screens. Serve, say serve. Serve, serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not people. The sermon title of week number four of Evidence 2.0, taking down notes, is The Tourist Trap. The Tourist Trap. Let's pray. God, I thank you today for your faithfulness. God, I thank you today that we are shifting our mindsets today. I was praying this prayer on the way over today. My Father who sits in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Come on, somebody say amen. I just felt like a little traditional prayer for that moment. So uh, two years ago, how many of y'all do like a little getaway, a little siesta, a little family break, maybe during the summer? You're like, not with, these, not with this economy. But you know, you get a little break, like a little mini break or like a little, even if it's a staycation. Well, for us, uh, a family of six, the old Airbnb actually works out best for us. So we found this Airbnb near the beach and it was reasonable. And we're like, let's go. We're going to go to the Airbnb. So we go to this place and we walk in. Now, I'm a pretty meticulous guy. I'll be honest. You can see the way I line out my beard. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a meticulous gentleman. And so uh, I walked in and, and the kids all threw their stuff in. And we got the food from the car and all that stuff. And I noticed something right away. I noticed that right in the foyer area of this house, there was a lot of marks on the walls where people probably just brought their bags in and just kind of, how many of y'all are those people? Like you just kind of sling your bags in and you're like, come on kids, get in the house. Don't ask me for anything. There's a box of cereal, eat whatever you can. <laughs> We're surviving right now. So there was marks everywhere. And I was like, huh? And uh, I thought, well, maybe they, cause it was pretty clean, but I was like, maybe they just didn't have a chance to uh, touch them up. How many of y'all, that bothers you a little bit? Maybe a little bit? No? Okay. Okay, great. Okay. You're part of my club. Great. It just bothered me a little bit. Uh, the first impression wasn't phenomenal. I didn't leave a weird review or anything, but we went back because we loved that place. We went back a second year. Not only, <laughs> because I took pictures, not only were the same marks there, but new marks. And I'm like, what is happening here? And she's like, okay, babe. I'm like, no, listen. I, like, I may get a paint swab and go get some paint at the Home Depot and <laughs> touch these things up. Well, why are you telling us that? There's a massive difference between, a, between an owner mentality and a tourist mentality. There's a massive difference because if I was the owner, oh yeah, my first impression of that place, I would have wanted to make sure it was touched up and nice. If you've ever been on a cruise, which by the way, you can go out of Galveston now, if you've ever been on a cruise, you'll notice at obscure uh, times of night, now you also have the ability to eat whenever you want. So if you're walking around, you'll see these people. They have a little little like bucket of paint and a little paintbrush. And there are people 24 hours just touching up and keeping the first impression looking great. And I was, I was a little thrown off. And then we end up at the beach later on. And there's this group, let's just say they're from Dallas. Um, <laughs> Let's just say that. that. And they left all their trash on the beach. Like Red Bull cans and snack wrappers. And, and they just got up and they just were rolling out. I was like, hmm, fake Texas. You know what I mean? Like, guys, stop it. We have Dallas people that watch. You could move here. You know what I mean? Like, anyways, <laughs> seriously. So, so uh, this older gentleman and his wife walked by. And I assumed they're locals. Now, a couple giveaways. They smelled uh, like coconut oil and Panama Jack lotion and butter. I don't know what was on them, but they were very brown and they had enjoyed lots of vitamin D. They had been on that beach. Come on. You could tell they were not a tourist. They were locals. And I noticed them. They started picking up things and they were taking it to the trash can. So I jumped up and went over and said, let, let me help you. And I said, why are you doing this? I, just, cause I wanted to ask, why are you doing this? And they said, we're locals. The locals keep the beach clean. Uh, these tourists, they don't, they don't care. And I say, yeah, I know where they're from. You know what I mean? Like, and he goes, no, no, like we, we make sure that the trash doesn't get in the ocean. It can, it can choke out turtles and it can mess with sea life. And he said, and I said, well, do you own one of these houses? He said, oh, no, no, no. But I have the mentality. Watch this. I have an owner's mentality. This is my beach. This is my city. 
I don't want to just walk by it and assume it's someone else's job. So this isn't like a big plug for Disney, but at Disney, in every employee's handbook, custodial is listed on their job. Why? Because don't assume it's someone else's job. It's all of our job because it's our house. Come on, somebody say this is my house. It's our house. And so the difference between an owner mentality and a tourist mentality, now some of y'all, I don't know where you're from, so I feel like the word tourist sounds like tour, like T-O, you are like it's a tour. Some say it's a tourist mentality. Or, and, okay, anyways, how many of y'all say tourist mentality? How many of y'all say tourist mentality? How many of y'all say tourist mentality? <laughs> All right, how many of y'all say T-Rex mentality? Okay, so why are you telling us this? I feel grieved. I'll be really honest. Now, I'm going to step on some toes. If this is your first time here, I normally like to tell a lot of fun stories. But I feel a little grieved with the American church. I feel a little grieved with the Americanized church. Now, we have people that watch from all over the world, so you can disconnect for just a moment. But I feel grieved with the American church because we have a very red carpet sort of mentality. We have a, I didn't get the right parking spot. Somebody took my parking spot. Now I'm bugged. Uh, I, the coffee wasn't as hot as I was hoping. Somebody, can you believe somebody took my seat? I sharpened my name under the seat. Just don't do that, please, because we move them around, okay, just so you know. Uh, Rodney led worship today. It was great. He didn't do a song I liked or even knew. What, what was that song that Mariah was singing? Like, it was good, but like, I couldn't even sing it. And we had this red carpet mentality. Who's this guy with the J's on? You told me he was funny. I'm not very inspired. And we have this mentality of uh, just kind of show up. And if I like it, it works. Who's touching up the walls? I don't know. Who takes out the trash? I don't care. It's not mine. Instead of, no, this is my house. The owner mentality versus a tourist mentality. And let me be really honest. As a pastor, some of you are like, aren't you supposed to be? Like, You're clergy. You should be honest all the time. <laughs> No, the truth is, as a pastor, we can't build on tourist mentality. We can't take more territory in our city and around the world with spectator mentality. We have to build on owners. Elbow the person next to you and say, it's time to own something. Come on. And then look at your second choice and say, you have the eyes of a tourist. Okay, what are we talking about? <laughs> don't do that. That's terrible. But watch this. This is key. You know you don't have to own anything to have an ownership mentality. I have adapted this new mindset over the past few years. When we're at a restaurant, like as a family, and I go to wash my hands, if someone has left the water on, I don't assume somebody else should turn that off. I don't say, I'm not paying the bill. I don't care. No, I turn that water off. Why? Owner mentality. When we're shopping for kids' clothes, because they're growing like weeds, and we have to... Now, now listen... Like some places, because when I say this, you're going to be like, that's not everywhere. But some places, you know, if the clothes are hanging off the hanger or there's clothes on the ground. Now, some of you are like, that sounds like TJ Maxx and Marshalls, where you're like, this isn't my size. Like, it's not my size. <laughs> but in life, if I see something hanging off or it's laying on the floor, owner mentality says... Let me pick that up and adjust it because there's probably somebody that works here that's a little overtasked trying to keep up with all of this owner mentality. Say owner mentality. It is someone else's job. But you could say everything I do. Let's go back again to the anchor verse. I want to serve wholeheartedly as if it was for the Lord, not for people. It's a mindset Shift, And I truly believe, watch this, that God is often looking to see how we steward what's not ours so that he can trust us with what he has planned for us. How do you take care of other people's stuff? Well, I'm a runner. I don't even care. They, somebody else needs to do this. Or you can have an owner mentality. Uh, we leased for a long time. And I remember the landlord called and said, hey, I just want to thank you. Now, this isn't a pat on my back. It's more of hers, but... <laughs> And said, you treated this place like you owned it. Like you took care of attention to detail. I didn't tell her I was <laughs> OCD and like, you know, I got to keep things in check. But no, she was like, no, literally the carpet stayed clean and you didn't have a bunch of marks on the walls and you guys made sure you took care of it. And I said, because I believe what you reap is what you sow. Amen. And we're going to own again. So I'm going to treat this place like I own it. It's an owner mentality. Look at the person next to you and say, owner mentality. Owner 
mentality. I truly, though, believe that God is like, what can I trust her with? Let me see if she'll be a good steward with what's not hers or his. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says it this way. If you're faithful in little things, what's it say? You will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Here's what I've experienced. God won't trust us with more until we're grateful for what we have been given and we're faithful with what he's already handed to us. He won't give you more. But society now, it's all about addicted to more. I, I need more. I, I got a cons- It's a consumer mentality. But God's like, hey, can you be faithful with what I've given you? Because I can't bless you with more. You're literally, listen, I've said this before. You can't stop God's blessings, but you can block them by getting in the way. Or you can say, God, trust me with more. And I promise I'll steward what you're asking me to steward. So Lord speaks to me a lot uh, as a dad. And so my daughter, Daphne, who's sweet as, like she's the sweet, Finley's sweet. She's on the front row. Daphne's like sweet, sweet. Finley's the heat. She's the heat sweet. So she'll put on lip gloss, but then fist fight you. That's sweet heat. (laughs) Sweet heat. It's different than sweet, sweet. So anyways, Daphne asked me one day for a banana. She said, Dad, I want a banana. And I said, okay, how do you ask? And she's like, I want a banana. (laughs) Okay, a little snarky like your mom. So I went and got got her banana. And I came back and she looked at me like, and I said, what? And I'm looking at it. I'm like, is it too green? Is it it like borderline, like, like ready for banana bread? Like what is the, and she goes, I wanted two bananas. And I said, what? And she said, I wanted two bananas. So I went and got another one, and I ate it in front of her. I don't know if that's good parenting. I don't know if it's good parenting, but I did. I was like, I don't know. Like, and I looked at her, and I said, Daphne. And I began to explain to her, and this is what I felt like from the Holy Spirit. This is the way we often approach him. We say, God, I wanted more. I wanted more. And then he blesses you, and you're like, that's it? But did you notice that you blessed her a lot more than me? But you don't know that she's a tither, and she serves, and she has been has been faithful with what God has entrusted her with. And we get caught up in the mentality of the errs, like they're funnier and prettier and better and they seem happier. And God's like, can you just be grateful for what I've placed in your hands? And I feel like oftentimes that's that's the way we treat God. I wanted more. I wanted two bananas. And he's like, listen, you just eat the one I gave you. Amen. (laughs) How many of you guys have ever fallen in that trap before? So again, we're all entrusted with specific things. And God has asked us to have an owner mentality with a few things. Here's one of them, our time. How you manage your time is essential. How you manage your time. Some of y'all are just surviving the day. You get to three o'clock, you're like, whoo, it's my third cup of coffee time. And then I know I can go to bed at nine. I'm like, amen. Now how we, how we own our time, how we manage our time, the talents that he's given us. Because by the way, and I've said this for the last few weeks, uh, the talents, the problem with our gifting and our talents are we withhold them oftentimes because we think that they belong to us. When the truth is they're from God to us and through us. How are your talents serving others? Because any of our Hope City Worship team, give it up for Hope City Worship. Like they're phenomenal. And there's nothing wrong with this, but they could all say, oh, no, I'm not going to waste my talent on a weekend where I have to get up at 5.20 a.m. Actually, way earlier than that. What time are y'all here? 6 a.m. for run through. Some of y'all are like, that's why I'm not on the worship team. (laughs) And some of you just can't sing. Like, you shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like, that's ridiculous. All right. But they could say, I'm not going to waste my time on that. I'm going to be Houston's idol. I'm going to just go to every single, again, nothing wrong with American Idol, nothing wrong with the voice, nothing wrong with any of that. But if your mentality is these belong to me and God's like, hey, I want you to have an owner mentality, but they belong to him. The other thing is our resources. How are you with your generosity? Have you not looked at the economy? It doesn't mean the principles of sowing and reaping don't work. We are still called to promote, bless, and so into the kingdom of God so that more people like us can be reached. How many of y'all are here because someone invited you? Come on, wave at me. Somebody told you about it. 
How many of y'all are here because you just stumbled upon the online or the Instagram or, or something like that? How many of y'all found it on MySpace a long time ago? How many of y'all went on LinkedIn? I don't know your life. Like, no, but the truth is, we're all here. Watch this. This is sobering. We're all here because someone gave. We're all here because someone showed up and served. You're sitting in a seat because yesterday, for hours, Dream Team showed up and set up every one of these seats and set them up in rows and prayed over them. We're all here because someone sowed, someone served, and someone recognized my gifting doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. God set all this up, and we can actually, in the moral compass of our life, find direction of the most generous of most generous. Watch this. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, y'all know the verse, at the Super Bowl, there's always that one guy with the sign that's like trying to get in the camera shot with it. For God so loved the world that he gave. Say he gave. He gave. He's, the, he's the foundation of what a blessing and what a giver should look like. He gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever believes in him, and all of us, by the way, are whoever's, all of us, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God gave us Jesus so that we would have our sins forgiven, our purpose for living, and one day, ultimately, a home in heaven through the gift of salvation. Jesus is the original gift given to us from God, and God wants each and every one of us to live out of the overflow of his kindness and his generous heart towards us, so in return, we live our lives with a spirit of generosity. Acts 15, 11 says this, we are saved because the master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity moved to save us. Do we have that verse? Can you put that up? I see it. Okay, great. God wants us to be, that's okay. We got a lot more services. Amen. <laughs> Give it up for our production team, our creative team. Y'all, they put in the time. It's amazing. God wants us to become more generous, not just for, watch this, for one season or for just one project, but he wants us, with an owner mentality, to manage our time, our talent, our resources for our entire lives. And I'll admit, being generous isn't easy because we live in a very materialistic world. We're very self-centered. It's all about me. It's all about the me, myself, and I sort of mindset. And we end up bending and conforming our hearts and even ideology to the selfish ways of modern society. But watch this. You always will come up empty. You will not enjoy the outcome. It leaves us feeling depleted. And when you don't have a generous heart, this is what I said a moment ago, you become addicted to more. But this belongs to me. Why do I have to give it to help reach somebody else? Like, I need, I need mine. I, it's all, it's got to be about, it's got to be about me. And I, ooh, I looked up the definition of the word miser. Some of y'all are like, why would you do that for the sermon? Here we go. Definition, definition of the word miser, it's on the screens. A person who hoards money or possessions, often living miserably, considered a selfish person. Look at the person next to you and say, don't be a miser. And then look at your second choice and say, unless your last name's miser, and then we're gonna have to figure that out. It's no accident, though, that the word miser comes from the same root word as miserable. And statistically, y'all, takers are miserable. How many of y'all have ever been around or you know a taker? How many of y'all, you are the taker? Okay. I love the transparency here. Like I'm, but I want to be free. I'm building my testimony. Amen. No, takers are statistically miserable. And here's the truth. I need, I need this is going to be freeing. Here's the truth. Nobody is born generous. Have you ever been around a two or three-year-old? Like I, there, was this, there was this Instagram reel of this dad and mom, and they were so excited. They, were, they finally got their little girl to like eat solid foods, and she was... She was all about it. And so the dad was like, hey, come on. He had his phone. And he's like, hey, can mom, can mommy have some of that? And she goes, no. Like, it, like it, was, it was awesome. Listen, we were, none of us were born generous. And as our kids are growing up and they're like, no, it's mine. I'm like, boy, I paid for that. You give it to me. I'll maybe give you some back. <laughs> but the truth is the, the story of Daphne is the way we respond a lot of times. I wanted more because being generous and becoming generous with your time, your talent, and your resources is a skill that has to be developed through 
Two things. Repetition. This is the big one. Willingness. That's why a lot of times we sit on the sidelines forever. When immediately following the service, we have something called HC Connect. And you can go through HC Connect and discover your purpose And that's where purpose comes alive. We tell you about the vision and who we are and why we exist. And then we talk about God's gift and God's assignment and his purpose in your life so that we're not just spectators. We don't just have a tourist mentality, but you're like, oh, I can own that. I can serve in the kids. Oh, I can be in the parking lot or I can be a greeter. I'd love to be a part of hospitality. There's so many different areas. One more time, make some noise for our dream team. Come on. And you can go through HC Connect immediately following the service. All right, I'm going to run through these pretty quick. Number one, I want you to write this down. Why is being generous so important? Number one, because generosity, we're talking about time, talent, and our resources. Generosity helps us become more like Jesus. And that's the goal. The goal is to become more and more Christ-like every day. To be more like him, John chapter 3, verse 30. Let him increase and we decrease. Psalms 37, 21 says, the godly are generous givers. Here's a loaded statement. You simply cannot become more godly without becoming more generous. Because if you're stingy and you hoard your talents and your time and you're selfishly motivated with your resources and this all belongs to me, even the breath you're breathing doesn't belong to you. It's from God. And that you woke up again today is proof of his keeping power. The godly are generous. I read this study on some specific keywords in the Bible. For you Bible nerds, you're going to love this. I studied the keywords of believe, pray, love, give, and a few others. But watch this. The word believe is used 272 times. It's pretty amazing. The word pray is used 371 times. 371. The word love, that's a big one. I love you, bro. What's up, I love you. The word love is used 714 times. This one's huge, though. But the word give is used 2,162 times. 2,162 times. Why is this? Because the Lord wants us to become more generous so that we can be more like him. The apostle Paul said in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35, watch this. You should remember the words of our Lord Jesus. He said, it is more blessed. Another translation says it's better, way better. It's more blessed than to give than it is to receive. So again, generosity helps us become more like Jesus. Say out loud, I want to be more like Jesus. Come on. Number two, write this one down. Generosity, time, talent, resources is the cure for our selfishness. Woo. Somebody should have shouted on that one. We're like, no, I'm not going to shout. Generosity is the cure for our selfishness. The definition of the word selfish, it's pretty self-explanatory. A person, action or motive, lacking consideration for others, concerned with one, uh, one's own personal profit or gain, because let's be honest, we at, at some point in our lives, and maybe you're currently in this season or you've been in it before, We all have been selfish at one time, and the truth is, because of sin nature, we're all selfish at our core. Some of you have already looked in the mirror 25 times today. Like you flipped the thing down and looked and flipped it down and flipped it, okay. And we live in a society, though, now that says, get yours. Climb the ladder, step on as many people and anybody and everybody that you can. Make sure you get yours, but there's always a cost to selfishness. Selfishness hurts those that love you the most, Selfishness will rip you off of God's best and God's favor in your life. I said it a moment ago, you can't stop God's blessings, but your selfishness can, can block them. Selfishness ends up ultimately hurting others. The book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, this verse is pretty self-explanatory. This is a directive. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Ooh, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. That's parenting. For us, I mean, my wife's the most selfless person I know. She said to me the other day, she said, you know, you know when you're stressed because you got to take care of you? She's like, I got to take care of these four kids and you. I said, amen. 
My God. You're right. I feel better. Amen. Let each of you not look to your own interest, but also the interest of others. When's the last time you've gone out of the way, gone out of your way for somebody else? It may be a simple gesture as just paying it forward. I watched this reel the other day. It was so funny. This, this little girl, she's probably 11 or 12. She's like, Daddy, pay for the car behind us. And he was like, he was pretty country. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Hey, she, I'm going to go ahead and pay for the car behind us. And the barista said, okay, it's $83. She said, good Lord, what'd they get? Like, <laughs> and they said, can I pay for half of it? <laughs> And the daughter's like, no, dad, you got to pay for all of it. He's like, he was like reluctantly handing his, his, he's like, good Lord, that's expensive. Now the truth is that when's the last time you've gone out of your way to smile at somebody, to encourage somebody, maybe during your devotional time, if you took that time to do your devotional time, maybe during your devotional time, God spoke something to you. How often do you pass it on? How often do you encourage others? With the love of God, Proverbs 119 says, such is the fate of all who are greedy for money. This breakdown of money, it actually goes beyond that. It's also tied to what God has entrusted you with. Watch this last line. It robs them of life. The truth is materialism creates all kinds of trouble. And I'll repeat what I said earlier. When it comes to this sort of mindset, we get addicted to more, and there's nothing wrong. Let me say this as a disclaimer for all of you who are hiding your Gucci belt. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, as long as nice things don't have you. As long as it's not consuming you to the point where you're no longer clinging and trusting to God, because what ends up happening is you'll feel pressured to keep up. That pressure to stay up to date with everything going on in the world. And here's the truth. Theodore Roosevelt said it best. He says, comparison is the thief of joy. When you look at everything else that everybody else has and you're not grateful for what God's entrusted you with, then you'll always have a renter mentality and never an owner mentality. No, God, I'm gonna take care of what you've blessed me with. You know, I noticed this. I notice how people take care of their shoes. I notice how people, and that's what, some of you are like, you can watch the way I walk so I don't crease these. You know what I mean? like, <laughs> now, I notice a little thing. I notice how people take care of their, like, their floors, like carpet in their house. Like, we kick our shoes off. I like to say it's because of Southern hospitality. Now, I just don't want you dragging in the residue of where you've been all day. Don't walk up in my house after you've been at Golden Corral. Like, <laughs> tracking in Salisbury steak. I'm like, just kick them off of the door. <laughs> Make yourself at home and don't drag that gross stuff in here. No, I notice it. There's a difference between just walking in and throwing your bags against the wall like the Airbnb and someone who says, no, 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 kids, someone will have to paint this. Owner mentality. Somebody say owner mentality. The only way to overcome this type of mentality, this tourist mentality, this taker mentality is to become more generous. Here's my gifts. Here's my talents. Here's my time, God. Here's my resources, because it all belongs to you, because every time you give, your heart grows bigger. Then you start growing more spiritually, and ultimately you break the grip of that materialism in your life. Come on, if somebody's getting something out of this, say amen, I'm looking at you. People online are gonna think this is a room of mannequins. All right, number three, write this down. Number three, quickly, help, uh, generosity helps us deepen our relationships. That's huge. Generosity helps us deepen our relationships. When you give, giving will always draw you towards whoever you're giving to. So if you give to God and his work and the kingdom, you'll grow closer to God. If you give to other people, you'll grow closer to them because your heart always follows your treasure. That's how God created and designed us. Matthew 6, 21 says, your heart will be where your treasure is. Pastor Jack and I have always noticed that. We've recognized that. As believers, that when we sowed into God's work, we were more, we ended up more compassionate for others. We started noticing and looking at people through the filter of compassion. We started noticing others and saying, wow, God, you could use my life to reach them. And if you don't, then you'll just pass people every single day because you're just busy with your to-do list. You're busy with what you have to accomplish. But where your heart is, your resources will be. Where your heart is, your time, your talent, and your giving will be. So let me just say this as a massive challenge today. If you call Hope City home, get off the sidelines. If you call Hope City home, 
Don't withhold your time, your talent, and your giving because, again, it belongs to God. All right, number four, write this one down. This one's going to help somebody. Generosity helps stretch and strengthen our faith. How many of y'all need to grow a little bit more in your faith? Come on, every day, every single day. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 to 11 says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. I love this right here. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. In Romans 12, the apostle Paul talks about how we're all given a measure of faith. But you know, we can stay at that same measure of faith our entire lives. And there are things in life that will stunt our growth and our faith but like a muscle every day when you cling to the promises of God and you're in his word and you're reading the word or you're listening to his word, what ends up happening is your faith grows. We have a, we have a gentleman uh, on our safety team. Uh, by the way, y'all, uh, we have an incredible and a phenomenal safety team. Can we give it up for our safety team? We prayed a lot for our friends at Lakewood and what they walked through. We got a gentleman on our team. He looks like my stunt double. And, uh, but the difference is he was born with muscle mass and I wasn't. So <laughs> he clearly works out all the time and, and he's a big dude. And the truth is we all, at some point, if we were super disciplined like that, we ourselves could break somebody's arm when we uh, arm wrestle them. <laughs> Same is true of faith. You can grow your faith every day and faith grows where you water it. Faith grows when you take time to spend time in the presence of God and you're in this constant posture. Pastor Matt got up here and sang, I surrender all to you, everything I give to you, withholding nothing. That surrendered posture of withholding nothing says, God, bless my time. God, bless my gifting. God, bless my resources, what I release in my hand and I don't hoard and hold on to, when I release it, God, I thank you that you're releasing what's in your hand. And through my life, people will see your generosity and compassion and passion for the things of God. Faith is like a muscle. When you use it, your faith will grow. One biblical growing kind of biblical nugget that we can walk away with, actually two verses, Romans 10 verse 17, says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Maybe you're not a big reader. Put on audio Bible. When you're driving to work, just listen in the beginning. Put it in a British accent. You can put it in Australian. I don't care. But just listen to the word. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. One of the biggest ways God tests our faith, watch this, is through our time, is through our talents and our finances. I know so many people that will trust God they try, how many of y'all have gone from nothing to something? Come on, from rejected to accepted. Like, you trust God that his salvation paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Like, you believe that? He saved me. He set me free, all of that. But then you're like, but God, this is mine. But this is my time. This is me time. I trust that he saved me. He created the entire universe. He shaped and molded me in his image, but... God, when it comes to uh, my giftings, like I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be too bold about them. When it comes to my giving, I don't want to be told that I have to. And let me just say this: here at Hope City, you're not going to ever feel arm twisted. Like you're never going to hear me say this section over here is the thousand dollar section because then none of you'd be over there. You'd be over here next weekend. <laughs> We're like, where's the twenty five dollar section? What about the two hundred dollar section? Now, I'm not gonna, you're not going to feel or, or ever hear a manipulative sort of uh, phrasing to try to manipulate you into giving. Here's the truth. The principles of sowing and reaping work. If you give, he's going to bless you. If you don't, then, then you won't be blessed. That's just the way the principles of giving are. Now, you'll be blessed because he's a good God, but do you want to live in the overflow of it? Do you, do you want to see God unlock your gifts and unlock what he wants to do through your time and your resources? Do we want to take more territory and reach more people like you? Take more territory and launch more campuses around our city like this one? Because I, I do. And the truth is, we've said this, and it's almost become kind of a flippant statement, but we move at the pace of, of our generosity as a church. And so as our church is giving, as our church is serving, as our church is showing up and setting it up, our church is releasing their time, their talent, their treasure, y'all, 
There's no limits to what God can do through our incredible church and through your life. Somebody say it through my life. Come on. And honestly, it comes down to this. We have to change the mindset of this all belongs to me and shift it to this all belongs to you. Number five, generosity unlocks increase in our lives. Psalms 112 verse five says, good will come to those who are generous. God wants to bless us and he has set things in this perpetual motion so that we will be blessed when we follow his will and the principles again of sowing and reaping work. I grew up on thousands of acres in a farming community and we were simple folks and my grandpa was a farmer, my uncles are farmers, my cousins are farmers and it's the principles of literally they plow the ground, they put the row, they put the seed, we water that seed, thank God for sun and then you get a harvest and they supply corn and soybeans and stuff all over the nation and mostly in the Midwest but the principles of in the natural of sowing and reaping work and it also works spiritually. Second Corinthians chapter nine Verses six through eight says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must, this is where our part comes into play, verse seven, you must decide in your hearts how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. By the way, this whole front row today, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, that, that's, that, you're not gonna get that here. We're going to be transparent about where we're at as a church and say, come on, let's go take a city together. For God loves a person who's a cheerful giver. Smile real big. Every time, no joke, I, I pull my phone out and I scan the QR code last service and, and I gave. And as soon as I did it, I went like this. <laughs> Why? Because he loves a cheerful giver. And some of y'all need to just put on some joy. Because all the time you're like this. <laughs> I don't want to get certain lines on my face, so I just don't smile. <laughs> Come on, Victoria Beckham, quit it. <laughs> like, no, he loves a cheerful giver. Look at the person next to you, smile real big. Oh, that's awkward. And then just make eye contact with him. Make eye contact. Don't break it. <laughs> and God will generously provide, watch this, all that you need. How much? Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You know what blesses me? is seeing the smallest incremental reoccurring gift that comes in every month. A single mom or someone off of their welfare check. There are people that can give larger, but here's the truth. It's all significant in the hands of God. To see single moms who say, hey, I hardly have enough gas money to get to church, but I met someone else who's even worse off than me, and I blessed them today. God will provide everything that you need so you have left over to share with others. Over and over in the Bible, we're told that he blesses generous people. It's far more fun to give than to receive. Statistically, the happiest people on earth are givers, not takers. The happiest people on earth are the ones that, man, my gifting is making room and my character is keeping me here and my time, man, I just feel rewarded. They have interviewed those that are struggling with suicidal ideology and depression and anxiety and panic attacks. They've interviewed them after serving those less fortunate at a soup kitchen or an outreach where, by the way, our uh, Hope City Missions packed half a million meals yesterday. That's huge. Let's we'll feed the hunger. And yes, it's tiring and it's exhausting, but every one of them was like, half a million? We just helped a half a million people. It's better to give than it is to receive. And the happiest people statistically are those that give, not takers. Number six, this is the last one. Generosity is connected to an eternal investment. The investments we make here in this life only last one lifetime. But when you give and invest into the kingdom, it creates eternal opportunities. It helps us preach the gospel. It helps us reach people from neighborhoods to nations. It helps us, I said this earlier, launch new campuses. It helps us take more territory, create missions initiatives. It helps us invest more into our kids program. Come on, mom, mom and dads, make some noise. That's amazing. It helps us continue to invest into our youth ministry, our young adult ministries. It helps us Katie, I'm, we're believing, we're standing with you for a building, but here at West Houston, y'all, it's helping us build a building. When you're generous and you guys are sowing into what God is doing, that's where you should clap. Come on, it's helping us expand the kingdom. Because kingdom seed and kingdom investments, your time, your talent, your resources, we begin to see the fruit of miracles. 
and breakthrough and 1,062 people that have committed their lives to Jesus this year because somebody gave. When we sow into eternal investments, watch this, the blessings never end. You're gonna have people, this is my greatest desire, I'll be honest, I cannot wait. My friend Todd's in the room, he's gonna be like, stop saying I'll be honest, because now I didn't believe the rest of your stuff. I can't wait one day. Now, I can wait because we have a lot of work to do on this earth, but I know one day there are going to be people that walk up to me in heaven and say, hey, I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you built that building. I'm here because you guys decided it was worth it to plant that campus near Sugarland. I'm here today because you realize that Parallel need needed the gospel and my mom got saved and then because she got saved, my dad got saved because he got saved. I'm here in heaven today because you gave. When you sow into the kingdom, there is a reward that lasts forever. Investing into eternal things is risk-free because you're investing in, in the one we ultimately trust the most, Jesus. And when you invest your time, your talent, your treasure into his church, you're making an internal Difference. I love Billy Graham's quote. He said, if a person gets his attitude or her attitude towards money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area of his life. I don't know what's going to happen in 2024. We have big faith. We have audacious faith. But my prayer, and we tell our CFO, Christy Walker, this often, our prayer is that we would have lots of opportunities to continue to give and be salt and light in our city. That if God's gonna move in this region, he doesn't overlook Hope City, he doesn't overlook us, but heaven will touch earth right here. And here's our prayer. Close your eyes for a moment, that God will provide and increase your life and resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in and through you and that you will be enriched in every way so that on every occasion, whether it's your time, your talent, or your giving, you would say, God, I wanna be available. With every eye closed, and when I say this, some of you are gonna be like, oh yeah, I've lived that, or I'm living that. I've lived this cycle so many times in my life, and I've discovered what feels like this ongoing pattern for the majority of my life, where I was always trying to do things in my own strength, trying to control everything, because I, again, thought it belonged to me, and I lived that cycle, but I finally came to this conclusion that I simply can't outgive God. That my time, my talent, and my resources are better used in his hands. So God, today I thank you that we recognize that our giving and our generosity isn't just connected to a special moment, but it's something you want to unlock in us throughout the entire year. And I pray, God, that the misconception was cleared up today, that you're trying to get something from us, or the church is always about my time, my talent, and my treasure, my giving, my resources. But the truth is, God, you're not trying to get something from us. You're trying to get something to us and ultimately through us so that we can reach others. So God, today we're committing to change up our mindset from a tourist mindset or a spectator mindset to a participator mindset to an ownership mindset and through our generosity, through our time, our talents. God, I pray today that we would shift our perspective. With every eye closed, maybe you've never tithed before. Today's a great day to start. Maybe you've never set up reoccurring giving and you've never given anything because you've had that sort of tourist mentality. Today's a great day to start. Maybe you have been sitting on the sidelines and God has been nudging your heart. The Holy Spirit has been needling you every week to get involved and jump in and serve. Today is a phenomenal day to start. We have a lot of work to do in our city, the nation and the world. And again, we cannot build on tourists. We have to build on owners, people who will partner with this church, Hope City as their home church, where they'll dig their heels in and plant their roots, where we can all together, unify together in one place and let it spread across our city, nation, and world, see greater miracles, a greater movement, see revival break out in our streets, in our city, where our children, we pass down that same fire to in our youth and young adults. 
Look at me real quick. I'm going to say this as transparent as I possibly can. As your pastors, if you call Hope City home, we can build on owners. We can build on people that have ownership mentality. Not everybody's welcome. And maybe you're here today and you're like, Pastor Daniel, I'm not prepared to be an owner yet. It's okay. There are two types of people that come into our buildings every week. There are people that are in a incubator season or a step on the pedal and let's run and go season. The incubator season, an incubator is created. My brother was born without a hip socket. And the doctors told and the surgeons told my parents, he'll never play sports, he'll never run right. He'll always have a little bit of a hiccup and a hitch in his walk and in his running. And this other doctor who was brilliant said, I have an idea, and he created this makeshift cast. Now between modern medicine and a miracle worker, they put my brother in this little heated incubator. And over a period of a few weeks, they took the cast off. You know, my brother never had any walking issues, ran. He still can't beat me in basketball, but it's all right. You know what I mean? Some of you came in today and you're in an incubator season. You're just trying to get some healing. Maybe you've experienced trauma. Maybe you've experienced brokenness at a level that no one fully understands, but God does. It's okay. You're welcome here. Maybe you're in the, I've opened the door and I'm no longer in the incubator and I'm ready to run, Pastor. Let's go. You're welcome here. But let me say this to those who are maybe in an incubator season. There's still room for you to serve. There's still room for you to get healed and whole in the midst of finding a community of others who won't judge you. And we're all going to grow together. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to heal and restore and do what he does best. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4 on the screens, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Would you all stand on your feet? Next weekend, we're kicking off a brand new series called A Place Called Home. And we're leading up to the Easter services where we're anticipating because of our trajectory of growth about 14 to 16,000 that weekend. Between our Good Friday services, our Saturday services, our Sunday services, and our additional campuses services. So this is my ask, that you would not only pray for those who are going to hear the gospel for the first time and be encouraged again, but also that you would lean in and start saying, okay, how do I participate? How do I show up? How do I serve? How do I sow towards this? How do I get off the sidelines and become a part so that we can take our city for Jesus, so that we can introduce people to the Jesus that aren't just a fancy painting, but the God who rose from the grave on the third day. And we're gonna celebrate his resurrection that day. So we're gonna shift, God, with our eyes closed for a moment from a tourist mentality, a renter mentality, to an ownership mentality today. God, only you can do it. I pray, God, for heart shifts today that people, God, would stop withholding their time, their talent, and their resources. But right now, God, we release it all to you. Would you lift your hands towards heaven open-handed for a moment? God, place a deposit in every single one of our lives. Remove anything, God, that's a lid or standing in the way as we press in and we lean in towards your word and we trust you at all seasons. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. I love this song. I love this line. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build your church. Come on, would you sing it? Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. Come on, little Polo, say it. It's your church. Build your church.
voice. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. God, build your church. One more time, one more time, one more time. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from Come on, the if you believe it's God's church and our best church. days are ahead of us, we need give you praise. Come on. Let's go. How many of y'all got something out of week four of the evidence? Come on. Elbow the person next to you. Say, get off the sidelines. Come on. Look at me real quick as we are wrapping up completely. We've got three additional services today. Our 530 service kicked off last week. Really excited about what God is building there. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor Dano, I needed this word because the truth is I have been a little bit stingy. I've been hoarding my time, my talent, my treasure. But the truth is I'm in a broken place with every eye closed. I'm in a broken place because I don't know Jesus as my Savior. But today... I want to give my life to him. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. The second invitation is this one. Pastor Daniel, I used to walk with the Lord, but I got caught up in the prodigal life. I've been living pretty reckless, but today I want to align my heart with him again and rededicate my life. I'm going to count to three. I'm not going to belabor it. If that's you, either one of those invitations, one, two, three, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see you, my friend. I see you, my friend. I see you, my friend. I see you, and I see you, and I see you, and I saw you back there. I see you over here and here and here. Come on, Home City. I see you back there. Amazing. Awesome. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, here I am. All my flaws, all my shame, all my issues, here's all my sin. I ask for your forgiveness, and I repent. I lay every one of my struggles at your feet, never to pick them up again, because I know you're big enough to cover it all. Jesus, thank you for hanging on that cross, for exchanging your life for mine, so that I can live a life of freedom filled with hope. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City, one more time. Give him praise.